All right, and welcome again. So uh, today I'm joined by Paul Kamun, which is a very interesting individual. Uh, he is the managing director of Space Pharma Europe. He is CMO of Space Pharma SA Corporate, engineer from Centrale Superlec from Paris, France, and PhD from MIT, uh, USA. He accumulates more than 40 years of experience in 150 space programs, especially for NASA and ESA, uh, and formerly uh, vice president of European business at TAS uh, and a member of the European Union Space Advisory Committee. So very diverse background again for, for Paul here, and, and I'm sure you'll find this webinar very, uh, again, insightful. So. Paul, uh, again, uh, glad to have you here once again. And uh, yeah, you can now you know, go ahead and introduce yourself further. You can introduce Space Pharma more and you, you can also feel free to share the screen as well if you'd like already. Oh, okay, Niklas, I think you, you had uh, uh, made a very good presentation. I don't have much to add concerning myself. I think uh, it's good to talk about our company. Uh, Space Pharma is, has been created in 2012. And uh, our main business uh, today is to develop miniaturized, remotely controlled laboratories uh, for microgravity uh, in space, mm -hmm. for life science and health in general, but with very wide applications from pharma to uh, cosmetics, to biotech, to nutrition and, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been already uh, eight times in space. We are preparing our ninth flight uh, in 2023. Uh, we had already 32 customers and uh, we are still growing because I believe that uh, there is uh, so much more to do now in uh, in life science in space. I think that's uh, the new revolution of space I think is there. And uh, so I expect to uh, have many more uh, customers to to open their eyes on these on these possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, so Paul, just a quick follow-up question on that. I mean, how has the uh, decrease in the cost of launch per kilogram has affected again the enablement of you know space uh, research and you know space manufacturing projects just in general yeah it's you 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 are absolutely right this is a key uh, key element i think um, 15 years ago what we are doing today would not have been possible there, there has been two major breakthrough uh, i would say uh, which which allows this kind of new space activity to to uh, mm -hmm. To develop, number one is indeed the uh, uh, lowering of the cost of access to space. Definitely, uh, that's that's one point, very important point. The second aspect is the miniaturization and the nanotechnologies and so on. Uh, and our lab is is the size of a shoebox, so it's it, it's only four kilograms. So if you put this kind of lab in the Dragon capsule of SpaceX which is able to embark like three tons or something like that. You see, we are, we are just uh, uh, one thousandth of, uh, of, of what is on board. Mm -hmm. uh, so three kilo compared to 3000. So it's, it's really this combination of uh, uh, lower cost of access to space and miniaturization, which is allowing us to, to do project at the cost which is competitive with cost on the ground to do similar research with the advantage that in space, we can do things which cannot be done in space mm -hmm. and which, sorry, can, which cannot be done on earth. And the other thing is we can even do it faster. I remember years ago, uh, Dan Goldin, the uh, administrator of NASA was uh, about 20 years ago, he was pushing the concept in earth observation of faster, better, cheaper. And it didn't come up uh, right away, it took a few years, but finally Earth's observation has have become faster, better and cheaper than, than the other technical means they had before. And I think we are now in life science also changing the paradigm of uh, developing pharma, developing cosmetics and so on. I think we are even able to do faster, better, cheaper and on Earth. And I think most people are not aware of that even in this industry. And uh, and that means that one of our biggest challenges is to educate those communities today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we see again, some of the more like daring projects also, right? When it comes to 
you know, orbital, like, you know, assembly. And, you know, we see all of those plans for like space stations for like commercial and manufacturing purposes. We see like some proposals for the, you know, orbital, like hotels, right? What, what not, right? So, which is again, yeah. very, very exciting. And, you know, this project that they have like by 2027 orbital hotel, I mean, seems a bit unrealistic, you know, the, in terms of the time frame. but just the fact that they set that as a deadline, they're really aiming for it. I mean, that's really a big accomplishment, even if it comes several years later, right? So that will be- Yeah, right. Uh, that right. will be very interesting. And again, now, now as we we're expecting to see, the launch rates will still continue to drop, uh, especially with the you know uh, SpaceX's new again developments that they're working on with the orbital Starship, and this will only allow for more of those projects and more involvement again, not only from like governments and you know like uh, big like corporations, but also from younger startups, from student-based projects, from academia, right? Which is also going to be very valuable and going to give us this myriad of data uh, that we can extract from those like on orbit research so so uh, i'll let you paul probably to to maybe go ahead now with a, a bit more broader overview of the space pharma uh and, and just go into the presentation i guess because you had you had one ready so um, well actually um there uh, i could i could show so many slides uh of uh, all the experiments we have been flying any one of them is is more exciting than the other one uh, I, cool. I, I prefer to refer to, to our website and so on. Okay. I, what I would say is that uh, we have a priority today. Our priority is to develop uh, drugs and, and new therapies. Uh, I think there are, there are so many, uh, so many diseases uh, which do not have a cure. And uh, the job of pharma companies is so complicated in terms of economy uh, that, that most of the big pharma are quite conservative. Uh, and when you combine this, this fact of having quite conservative uh, industry, even though they progress, of course, they try to innov innovate to the maximum. But uh, when you combine that with, with the, the incredible need uh, for, in particular, if you take, talk about the neurodegenerative disease, when you talk about Alzheimer, when you talk about Parkinson, you talk about all those things, which do not have really a cure today. And um, which means that the absolute priority uh, when you go to space and when you know that you, you are going to have a new environment, again, it will not be a magical rod. It's not like you go to space and, uh, and you solve everything, but it's a new environment where the physics, the chemistry, the biology behave differently. So you, you can certainly expect some innovations. And, and the first domain where we want to innovate is really pharma and medicine. Our secondary domain will be uh, cosmetics, for instance, because we know that uh, the aging is faster in space, so we can develop anti-aging products faster and so on. But I think it's very important to, uh, to, to, uh, to motivate uh, all the actors of the pharma and medical, because we have a tremendous uh, uh, pool of, of potential innovation there. Mm -hmm. So, so what is the case, Paul, when we're talking about like the, the aging and just generally the effects on the human body that the space environment has, right? So uh, are we, do we really, do we need uh, space, so space manufacturers, again, uh, pharma and, you know, all, all of those things to really help support this and mi minimize those effects or uh, how are we basically getting this data uh, from yeah, and, and how do you even even approach? I mean, developing uh, a, a product yeah. like that. So, yeah, I think it's a very good question because uh, indeed you have to make a choice on exactly what you want to develop in space. Mm -hmm. uh, what we want to develop mainly are the uh, what we call the active pharmaceutical ingredients. What people call the API. The API uh, can be a very high level compound, very uh, valuable compound. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are not going to develop in space aspirin. Uh, we are going to work towards uh, treatments which uh, uh, either are very uh, uh, hard to access on Earth because it's so expensive, trying to reduce the cost, or, or just treatments which do not exist on Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, this, this question of tackling first the active pharmaceutical ingredients of high value is our core activity. That's where... I think our business model makes more sense. And uh, that's where we have to focus. Today, we, our, our, our laboratory, both for R&D and for uh, in manufacturing, uh, 
uh, for R&D has been ready for a while, is TRI-9, but for in-space manufacturing, we are finalizing the, the, the realization. I think those, those systems will be uh, uh, ready very, very soon to do, to do production. And um, which means that now we are able even to, uh, to do ourselves, uh, to be our own customer, I would say. So mm -hmm. we prefer to offer our platform as a service to any kind of potential customers because it's such a great platform. But uh, we have also, when people are too slow to react on, on, on the innovation, we are able to do it by ourselves uh, end to end. And, and the work toward getting the IP and so on. So I would say we have two major activities. One is developing the lab, which is today operational. The other activity is developing the IP for drugs and therapies and so on. And uh, we are, depending on the project, we are doing either only using our lab or using uh, for somebody else or using our lab for our own, uh, mm -hmm. our own needs. So the business model, I think it's the, the, the field of life science and health is so complex, mm -hmm. is so large that uh, it would not make sense for a company like us to have a single business model. We have to be very much uh, adapting to, to the needs and to the customer which come to us. And these customers could be uh, hospitals, it could be a research institute, it could be big pharma, small pharma, small biotech companies, it could be anything, anybody working in the, in the life science and health domain. And we are open to any collaboration. And uh, we also look for customers, but we have many of them coming to us, which is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that, that's 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 good to hear and again uh, happy to know that you know you're doing good and the interest is really growing in this right so when we're talking about some you know unique and kind of harder to acquire or manufacture on earth like pharmaceuticals right so what would be some of those examples paul maybe just for the audience if you could just uh, name a few well i we we have we have developed already a drug for uh for a big pharma which is uh uh, helping um, uh, people with uh, pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened that uh, we have been crystallizing in orbit uh, some some uh, proteins uh, with much more pure crystals, much bigger, mm -hmm. which allowed the pharma company to transform the previous way that the drug was delivered to the body because of the bigger crystals that they could work with and the more purity, the bigger purity, they could transform it into a different delivery process and a medicine which was before rejected by the body because the body recognized it as dust. Mm -hmm. In After we produce these crystals, after this big pharma transformed its drug, it was accepted by the body. So it was uh, one example. We are working on other examples for, for instance, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. We are working in also changing the, the drug delivery process to, uh, to make it, uh, instead of being in hospital, to be at home by, again, making it more comfortable for the patient. But these are also some other uh, drugs, which, as I said before, which just cannot be done on Earth. The example I gave were examples where what you do in space will be better than what you do on Earth. But uh, what is the most exciting is to do in space things that you cannot do on Earth. Like, for instance, you will be able to do so to, to realize some uh, polymorphs of crystals, of protein crystals, polymorphs that you cannot produce on Earth because of the gravity. But mm -hmm. in the 3D uh, absence of gravity in space, you will be able to, uh, to develop some uh, structures of crystals which uh, just cannot exist on Earth. And, uh, and you never know what, what this property will be. Maybe it will be not interesting, but there are so many cases where uh, it will be a difference that certainly some cases also will provide a better drug. So it's a, it's a very innovative field and uh, nobody is able to, uh, to, to predict uh, uh, exactly what you will get because the, as I said before, the, mm -hmm. the environment is so different mm -hmm. that uh, each experiment that we carry out is uh, allowing discovery, mm -hmm. uh, more or less important, more or less economically valuable. But mm -hmm. each experiment we do in space is bringing something new, and uh, which means innovation is at every corner because the environment is another environment. 
and I would I don't dare to say it's another world, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's changing everything. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. I mean, nobody can really predict, right? So what, what the result is going to be, and it, it, it's pretty similar to one of the situations that you know with us happened in, in the past few days. So we just came up with some sort of a new kind of product, like a model for the company itself, like a new business-like product. And we had discussion with our advisors and, you know, everything. And, you know, we discussed, okay, this is it, this is it. So what's your, you know, what's your you? Is this going to work? Is this going to be good? You know, and they said, well, we don't know, like, unless we see it, right? Well, what it is, right? So because when you exactly. innovate, when you create something new, you you have to go and test it, right? So that's kind of the, the thing. And the question from this point of view, well, is how do you actually test that? I mean, after you have it ready. I mean, what, what? First of all, I mean, you cannot test it in space. You have to test it on Earth, right? Uh, is is that uh, actually? Yeah, it's it's a very good question. Actually, we have we have two ways to uh, to test okay. things. Um, number one, uh, in real time, mm -hmm. in real time, while it is in space. In our lab, we have all the imaging capability. We have the microscope, we have spectrometers. We can do lots of analysis. And our lab is uh, remotely controlled in near real time with our smartphone application. So we control our lab in near real time, which means that we can even change the experiment protocol in real time, which means that we can adapt the experiment as depending on what we see happening in space, that's that's number one. And in the same time, we carry out the same experiment on the ground to be able to compare in the best way. That's the first process. Mm -hmm. The second process is of course, when we bring things back from Earth, from space, then we analyze on Earth, all the products that we have got. And of course, we prefer uh, missions which come back. Uh, we have our own nano satellites where we can embark our lab but of course, the problem is today, nobody is able to bring back the nano satellites. I think it will change in a few years, but it's not the case. So today, the only way we have is the International Space Station, mm. which is a great way. But as you know, it's a resource which is uh, required by so many people. And uh, so it's not so easy to, to access, but uh, uh, it works very well. The International Space Station National Lab is a fantastic organization mm -hmm. set in place by the US. And there are collaborations between the US and the European Space Agency and with uh, JAXA in Japan and so on, mm -hmm. which means that uh, the access uh, has been made more easy during the years. But definitely, we need more. We need more access to space. And uh, of course, we know the ISS is going to finish normally in 2030. So uh, we, we are glad to see projects like Axiom, like Orbital Reef, uh, mm -hmm. yep. and uh, like Space Rider, like Dream Chaser. These will be vehicles very important to carry out our payload. And uh, today, we have we have more needs than what exists in terms of access to space. Mm -hmm. so, so just to make sure that, again, I understand this correctly. So again, you, you launch again your lab uh, into space, which does it go directly to ISS and it docks inside, or does it float in space and then it docks with ISS to be brought back? So which one is the is the right one? Yeah, the, the, no, the normal process. Okay, one process is to have our lab in our in our nano satellite, and the nano satellite is, is a free flyer, and we control it, and and that's it. But when we go to the ISS, uh, usually we we only need astronauts to to take the uh, the lab uh, from uh, either the Dragon capsule mm -hmm. uh, or whatever other capsule uh, which is attaching to the ISS mm -hmm. and to, to plug it inside the ISS. That's mm -hmm. the only thing we need. We need just to plug somebody to plug our lab uh, in the ISS, which means that the, the, the process is fairly simple. We, we integrate our lab in the capsule. Uh, we are among the last ones to come in because very often we have uh, biological cells, mm -hmm. so they cannot stay for months on the ground waiting for the launch. And when we are in space, uh, then uh, uh, astronauts usually take it and plug it in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perfectly. Okay, so that, that that makes sense. That makes sense. And then obviously, okay, so you 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 t test those pharmaceuticals, as you said, right? So you, so you test them in real time in space and on Earth, and then you bring those back sometimes, uh, you know, for major kind of testing process. 
and then after that is concluded, so you still need kind of some licenses and some approvals, right, to, to be able to distribute those. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, of course. Usually we have partnership. Uh, we have partnership with, with people for which uh, it is their business to do uh, the uh, uh, ground-based industrialization of a process. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for products of a very, very high value, we are able to do everything. I mean, all the active ingredients, we can do them in space uh, and we can uh, sell them. Uh, we mm -hmm. return them and we can sell them. But the last mile, I would say, of the production to the customer, uh, it's not today something that we ensure because it's not. It's, it's a specific business. This mm -hmm. is a business of uh, the big pharma and uh, they have been doing that for, for decades. Uh, so uh, the last mile to the customer is something that uh, comes today out of our uh, domain of interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so when we're talking more about specifically regarding the, you know, just producing it in space itself, right? So uh, what technology does this? I mean, is it like a 3D printer? Is this like some sort of a laser that's working on it? Or how, how does that work? Well, well, it's uh, depend, depending on what you want to produce, but uh, uh, um, the basic, uh, our basic lab is using micro 3 mm -hmm. So, uh, So it's based on the micro 3 technology uh, with miniaturized bioreactors. And uh, actually everything is miniaturized, but even more so the bioreactor. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what we, we are using. Uh, in our version today, which is our Space Pharma Advanced Laboratory, which is used today mostly for R&D. Uh, for, for the biggest version, which will be the uh, factory uh, module, it's using the same technology, but uh, at a bigger scale. Instead of being the size of a shoebox, it's the size of uh, like four shoebox. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we'll do the, the production. We can embark many customers in a single, a production module uh, and the, the basic technology is related to micro -fluidics. of course we have patents uh, we have many patents that we had developed in the in the first uh, five to six years uh, of the creation of the company be, before we made our first flight so that was about i would say five six years of r d uh, and uh, and then when we had the technology mature we went to speed but we are still improving uh, the technology, making things more exciting for the customer, but it's still evolving. But if I could s s summarize in one word, I would say it's essentially a micro fluidics. The 3D printing is, is another kind of technology that we are considering, but uh, this is uh, more uh, a domain, I would say, uh, where we people are still very much in the research. Uh, they are not yet at the production stage mm -hmm. for 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 new drugs for active pharmaceutical ingredients we are space pharma at the level of in space manufacturing uh, i believe for bio 3d bioprinting it would take it will take uh, uh, another period of of r d to to be mature on that mm -hmm. Okay, and, and what do you believe, Paul, again, will be the, the way to, again, accelerate, again, the work that you're doing, right? So what, what, what will be the, the solution quicker for that? Because, again, as you said, I see it has a, well, ISS, it has a high, like, demand, you know, so long waiting periods and, you know, everything, right? So uh, who would, like, let's say, uh, development of a separate, like, a station project, like, that will be allowing for, again, this type of work specifically and only for research purposes and, you know, only for the, you know, manufacturing of, like, pharmacy and, like, similar things be the solution for that? So do you see that as a solution or is there anything else that you foresee happening for that? Okay, I think I think the, the, there are two problems. One is this technical problem that, that you mentioned. The, uh, the other problem is the education of the market. So let's not let's not talk about the education of the market. This is a, a lot of uh, things like what you are doing. Uh, when, and, when in reality, that's the tougher one, right? <laughs> that's the tougher one. And that's yeah. what, uh, that what has to be done towards not the space community, but towards the, the life science and the application community. Uh, concerning the technical aspect, uh, yes, we would like to see more platforms uh, going to space. I am optimistic. 
I'm optimistic because I see so many projects of uh, small launchers. I'm sure not all of them was, are going to survive, but there are many projects. There are also many projects of uh, re-entry capsules, which mm -hmm. is something very important for us. And I even several projects of mini shuttles. There is a famous space rider on the European side and the dream chaser on the US side, but there is also now an equivalent in India. And they expect uh, this kind of type of vehicle uh, to, uh, to happen more and more. So I am optimistic uh, on the fact that uh, the uh, access to space possibilities for the type of thing that we need uh, will uh, will increase in the next in the next few years. So, the uh, the business plan is is on fairly safe grounds. Uh, of course, you never know what can can happen. Nobody is a prophet to to uh, predict the future. But I think so the number of projects that I see around uh, to access space and to come back because access is one thing, but come back is another one. Uh, and we are most interested to come back. Uh, I think the number of projects is quite uh, comforting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so, so so my next question is more regarding again the, the space pharma itself, right? So because th this is the type of project that's again really uh, a bit like very much to the innovation side and you know less to the tested grounds, right? So uh, is space pharma like venture backed? So is it like backed by private equity, like investors, or is it just uh, you know self sustaining in a way that you have kind of the uh, clients and you you know manage to build it up your way? So how how does that work, uh, Paul? Maybe you can well, it's share. both. It's it's both. Uh, okay. So the question, of course, because uh, for the creation uh, of the company and uh, for several years, so all the uh, all the R&D had to be backed by investors. Mm -hmm. And uh, since, and it's good uh, again that they were willing to do that because sometimes, you know, yeah, they, yeah. they just- It's interesting. It's interesting because some of the investors uh, had uh, personal reasons uh, related to, yeah. to medical- I'm not going to inquire to that, but personal reasons yeah. probably include some sort yeah. of like, uh, medical condition I mean, that could be solved with this, I, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, a, a, kind, of, a kind of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of philanthropy because you, mm -hmm. you know somebody who has uh, such a, a medical problem and you want to do something for him, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, so so it's very motivating. Actually, by the way, I I am, I am very surprised uh, that that uh, among all the investors in the world, uh, uh, and everybody uh, has somebody in his family who has some kind of problem, mm -hmm. close family, far family. And I, I'm very surprised that uh, not m many more investors uh, put money into discovering uh, therapies for disease which do not have a therapy. I'm very surprised. I think this uh, maybe the reason was that perhaps uh, there was not enough awareness. I mean, certainly uh, there was investment in uh, on on the ground for new advance, but people don't know that uh, space is able to create innovation. And I think. Maybe as far as investors will know about it, they will realize that they can do a, a much a much bigger philanthropic action mm -hmm. by uh, by investing in uh, in life science and health from space than uh, in other domain like telecoms or whatever, which is very important. But I think the return will be faster also. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of saving lives, mm -hmm. it would be much faster. And uh, I would encourage uh, investors to think really about it and to try to make an effort in this di direction. And that was the case of some of the investors of Space Pharma. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the beginning, it was backed by investors. Mm -hmm. We are still looking for more investment, but now I would say uh, we have been successful in doing enough commercial returns. So uh, the company is... Uh, stabilized and growing uh, in the right way so the two the two aspects are important indeed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I, I see sort of a resemblance also with the like deep space missions and you know companies that are looking for deep space exploration missions and you know vc is not being too much supportive of, of them just because it's like a long time return as they see and you know it's a risky business generally what i believe personally and i had many conversations i mean regarding this uh, with other startup founders and just the companies 
uh, that already are bigger companies with you know hundred plus employees and uh, what they mentioned reason why VCs are very careful when they're investing in the space industry is some of the previous examples that you know companies going bankrupt and just companies failing or you know unserious founders in the space industry which we had many including some of the you know like really like multi-millionaire individuals that were founding companies and you know just as, as they describe it toying with rockets in space right so you know that's been kind of like one of yeah, the right. reasons but right. i mean vcs and you know the private investors really have to again you know reconsider the situation and uh, really take a look at some of the successful companies that are you know working in the field like including space pharma i mean already you you, you had already the clients you had already uh, proven technology and proven missions that you have done so uh, that's uh, that's uh, you know amazing to see. Uh, so the 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 next question will be obviously Paul. So I mean, what what is next? I mean, for space pharma, so what what are you looking now currently to do? So are you developing new type of a lab that's you know going to be operational, or how are you again advancing your capabilities for uh, producing more and more efficient uh, you know pharmaceuticals in space? Well, clearly uh, uh, our next step is in space manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, at a bigger scale, um, we we are considering various uh, possibilities uh, using existing vehicle, uh, mm -hmm. having our own vehicle. Uh, also, how to do the up and down process, what mm -hmm. is more generally called the in orbit servicing. Yep. How we plan to to bring our lab up and our lab down. So we are investigating those questions today, mm -hmm. but uh, clearly. Uh, the uh, our biggest business will be in uh, in space manufacturing, uh, producing high value compounds, and uh, we hope to be able uh, to have our, our first operational uh, uh, factory production unit uh, on board the Space Rider uh, at the end of 2024 in the maiden flight, if uh, or if it's delayed a few months, no more than no later than early 2025. So. Uh, between the end of 2024 or 2025, we should have in orbit our first uh, in orbit production uh, uh, module for in space manufacturing. Perfect, wonderful, and again, excited, you know, excited towards that, and you know, seeing how this will play out. And I'm sure you're going to be good because <laughs> again, you pretty much stuff figured. Uh, already. Nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. A lot of yeah. I mean, yeah. Space, space is not easy, as they say, right? Yeah. So it's it, it is true. But again, when when the mission is important, you know, you you really have to push for it, even though you know it might not turn out turn out to be well. But you just keep persevering until you succeed, right? So that's uh, that's all it is about. Uh, okay, so for again any uh, you know potential investors that might be looking to invest again in space pharma or any potential clients you know that are looking for you know the the solutions of you know space manufactured you know and space developed like pharmaceuticals uh, you know again where to reach Paul uh, and you know you, you can find look up space pharma you're gonna find them it's the first thing that will pop up actually uh, if you Google it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, we, we wish you success again, Paul, and we wish success to your team as well. And we'll be again yeah. eager to see what, what what's going to be happening, I mean, over the next couple of years. But if you have any final remarks, Paul, I mean, regarding this subject, you know, uh, I think now, now now is the time. Well, I wish you all the best. I think it's an excellent initiative you are taking. And uh, uh, I hope uh, you, you have more and more of these kind of things with uh, uh, Lots of people were developing uh, space application and in particular in space manufacturing, because all the topics of uh, in space, uh, I mean, in in space servicing and uh, in space manufacturing are very much uh, related. And uh, I know the space agencies are making a big effort, uh, but uh, we need to motivate uh, all the customers' communities. Uh, it can, includes life science and health. Including it includes the material science, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it includes food tech, mm -hmm. agri tech. I mean, many communities have to gain with this new environment, and I think this kind of event that you organize is really going in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And this brought up just one more point that you mentioned, which you know uh, resonated, clicked with something uh, that, that that I was thinking about, which is you know uh, motivating the customers and just really educating them and. Because the way business is done in the space industry, it's slower if you compare it to, you know, other industries out there. Like it's very, 
very like complicated process, like, you know, and sort of like see all like kept in secrecy and shrouded in mystery and behind the closed doors. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's very tough to do business successfully in an environment like that. Right. So, uh, it, it also, you know, that that's also one of the points where I would love to see, get your insight on this topic, which, you know, uh, well, well, what do you see? I mean, is the reason for that? I mean, why why is it like that? So why is it happening? Um, yeah, historically, uh, historically, space had been a, a domain uh, where where uh, defense was uh, was uh, at the core. One of the uh, well, you know, the, the the main domains which have been at the forefront of technology have been uh, uh, astronomy. Uh, medical and and defense. Uh, those three domains have been the the the, the, the big three pillars uh, of uh, of technology development. And uh, since uh, since uh, defense is always one of these pillars, uh, there have always been uh, a kind of uh, uh, reluctance to uh, to be open or to to be uh, too much open on what is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think. It, we have gone gone to another era where where space has been more democratized, and in particular, new space. Even if you talk about the Earth observation, you see that uh, you can access very high resolution images mm -hmm. uh, in Earth observation that people twenty years ago they would have never have dreamed of or dreamed of getting because it was uh, confidential. Yeah, and, and we saw this during the beginning of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, right? How some of the private companies they just published. Yeah. I found those, some of the images all over LinkedIn. I mean, I was like, oh, wow. like you know, yeah, you, so you wouldn't expect. We, we, it. Yeah, you're right, and 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 we don't master this evolution. But uh, uh, what we can say for sure is that uh, new space is more open, is much more open. There will always be. Uh, Technological uh, confidentiality. There always there will be NDAs and uh, and CDAs and all that stuff. But I think the domain is being much more known to the general public. Mm -hmm. People can know quite easily how people work, what are the patterns, and so on. So I think it's uh, the domain is much more open than before, mm -hmm. and I think that's a, a positive uh, thing for the expansion mm -hmm. of the domain and for the customer and for the patients. When we are talking about our domain of life science, I think it's a good thing. The more people will will know about it, the, the more they will invest in it, the more uh, cure we will find, and the more therapies we will find, and the more lives we will save. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I think that's a good good note here to to conclude this uh, for today. And again, thanks, Paul, for you know being here and again sharing all these insights from your side. Thank you, Nicolas.